Thank you, Seth. And um, next week as well, we'll have a special service, and we won't be back in Ephesians then either, but uh, Lord willing, the next week we will. Well, Matthew chapter 2, a very familiar passage to all of us. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what is, has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Thank you, Amanda and Elizabeth. That's beautiful. This is a time to rejoice. Good message. Well, tomorrow morning, children will be excitedly opening gifts from under the Christmas tree. And some, maybe a boy or girl here, will be hoping for the holy grail of Christmas gifts. A Red Ryder 200 shot range model air rifle. I never got one. My mom thought it would shoot my eye out. But uh, well, that's tomorrow morning. This morning, sermons are being preached all across the continent against the commercialization of Christmas. I'm sympathetic. I know you're sympathetic. But there is some precedence for gift giving from the Bible, from the wise men of Matthew chapter 2, men who so valued the child born in Bethlehem that they laid treasures at his feet. The chapter begins with them arriving in Jerusalem after asking where the newborn king of the Jews was. They had seen his star and they had come to worship him. This, we're told, was in the days of Herod the king. He was known as Herod the Great. He was a great builder and politician. He knew how to work the system and gain power and keep it. But as he grew older, he became increasingly sick and paranoid, even toward his own family. He killed one of his wives. He later killed two of his own sons when he suspected them of treason, of wanting to usurp his throne. Well, this was the, the state of, my, of his mind when the Magi arrived in Jerusalem. He was a sick and suspicious old man when they came asking, where is the child born king of the Jews? 
Who were these men? We read that they had seen his star in the east where they lived and they had come to worship him. Well, there's a history of identifying him in various ways. He's been, they've been called the three kings. Matthew calls them magi. And tradition has it that their names were Melchior, Baltasar, and Gaspar. We can't be sure of their names. We can't be sure of their number or even their title. Magi was a term used of a priestly caste of Medes. Daniel speaks of the Magi in Babylon who interpreted dreams and practiced astrology and magic. These men were apparently stargazers, either in Babylon or Persia. And in their study in an eastern land, they noticed a strange phenomenon in the sky, a star. How did they know that it singled, uh, signaled the birth of the king? Did they have access to the Old Testament scriptures and the promise of the Messiah? There was a large Jewish community in both Babylon and Persia. Maybe they knew rabbis and read the prophets from them. Maybe they knew scriptures such as Numbers 24, verse 17, one of the earliest prophecies about the Messiah that told that from Jacob, a star shall come forth and a scepter shall rise. Christ is that star. Well, whoever they were, they were men of faith, great faith, because when they saw the star in the western sky, they followed it over a long distance to find the king it announced and worship him. The star is also mysterious. It seems clear from verse 2 that it was some kind of astral object or phenomenon, but what it was is not all that clear. Different ideas have been suggested. It may have been an alignment of the planets Jupiter and Saturn that occurred in the year 7 BC. Some have thought it was Halley's Comet. Johannes Kepler, the 17th century astronomer, thought it was a supernova an exploding star that gives light that's brilliant for a week or a few months. What's problematic for all of these is that in verse 9, Matthew says that from Jerusalem the star went before the Magi, led them to Jerusalem, or rather to Bethlehem, and stood over the place where Christ was. That doesn't sound like a supernova, a comet, a conjunction of planets. We don't know what it was. At least I don't. Uh, others agree. And William Hendrickson in his commentary wrote, we're all left in the dark. Warns against explaining it and simply calls it an astral phenomenon. The Lutheran commentator Linsky agreed with that. He traces the movements of the star, then calls it Absolutely miraculous, unlike any star that ever was. We don't try to explain, uh, we don't try to give a natural explanation to the virgin birth, and it was supernatural. Why should we then try to give an explanation to this? It's supernatural. Maybe, as uh, I think James Boyce and others have suggested, it was the Shekinah glory. I like that, but we don't know. It was, it was something, something real and something spectacular. Other than that, I think we are left in the dark. But by faith, these men followed it. Their faith is evident not only from their willingness to follow a star from a distant land, but from their purpose in coming. It was to worship the king. Later in chapter 14, verse 33, Matthew writes that when Jesus walked on the water, the disciples worshipped him and said, you are certainly God's son. Well, that's what the Magi came to do. Whoever they were, whatever they, wherever they came from, whatever they followed, 
They were there to worship the King and the Son of God. That's the lesson of the text. Wise men and wise women worship, and they worship Christ, God's Son. So, they, they must have been more than a little surprised when they finally arrived in the capital city, tired and dusty, and the king wasn't there. In fact, no one even knew about the king. They arrived uh, after a long journey full of anticipation only to find complete apathy in the nation. The king was born. He, he was heralded by a star. Imagine that. A star and no one cared. But as they spoke to the people and asked about the king and word spread, people became disturbed by the news. Matthew writes in verse 3, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Th this was a time to rejoice. Instead, people were troubled. Herod was troubled because news of a newborn king meant the coming of Messiah, who was a rival and threatened his throne. So Herod was disturbed. Herod was terrified and would stop at nothing to preserve his power and his position and hold on to his throne. He'd killed a wife and two sons to prove it. But to kill the child, he had to know where he was. So he called in the experts, the chief priests and the scribes. They told him the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. And to prove it, they quoted the prophet Micah from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. What a promise. What, what a promise that is. What a magnificent picture of Christ. He's a king, but he's prophesied as a shepherd who would care for them, lead them to truth, and lay down his life for them, a true shepherd, the good shepherd. What a contrast he was to the ruler they had, a tyrant and a cunning killer. He had a plan to kill Christ. He knew the birthplace, but he needed to know how to identify him. And so, to draw the Magi into his plot, he acted interested, and he sent them off with instruction, instructions to search carefully for the child, then come to me so that I too may come and worship him. And off they went, unwittingly, as is, has been, what someone said, private detectives for Herod. But God had other plans, and he's sovereign, and nothing can frustrate his purpose, not even that of a powerful king and a diabolical king like Herod. He would protect the Magi from involvement, and he would protect the child from death. So they left Jerusalem for Bethlehem, just a few miles south. Bethlehem means house of bread. And what a fitting place for, for the Savior the bread of life, to enter this world. Matthew writes in verse 9 that the star went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the Christ was. The, the Christ was. And, and that, that event of a, a heavenly luminary over the child not only attested to where he was, but to who he was, to the divine nature of the child. He is the light of the world. Prophet Micah did the same. He wrote also in that great prophecy that his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. This is a divine person. 
The star testified to that. And the wise men came prepared to confess that very thing. Verse 11 indicates that by their gifts and response. Matthew tells us that when they entered the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. They knew immediately who he was, what he was, knew that they were in the very presence of God. Their worship was intuitive. It was almost impulsive in the sense that they knew they were in the presence of the Lord, and so they fell to their knees with their faces to the ground because their hearts, their minds, their wills were in submission to God. They believed in Him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to Him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That was part of their worship, but, but more accurately, it was the consequence of worship. They worshiped, then gave gifts. Worship happens in the heart. It is spiritual. Gifts without the heart mean nothing to God. But gifts given in gratitude to our great God and Savior are worship. They are good and pleasing, and they are natural, the natural response. It is what a believer does and desires to do, to give of what he or she has to the one who has given everything to him or her. That's what happened here. Out of the desire of their hearts, as a willing sacrifice, they gave Jesus their treasures. And they were rich treasures. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They are also instructive gifts. Just as the star speaks of Christ, speaks of His origin, each gift speaks of Christ and His ministry. Gold is the medal of kings. In Scripture, it is associated with royalty. King Nebuchadnezzar is represented as the head of gold in the statue in the dream that Daniel had in Daniel chapter, or that he had and Daniel interpreted for him in Daniel chapter 2. Outside of Scripture, pharaohs were buried in gold coffins. Greek kings were buried with gold death masks. So the, the gift of gold was recognition that Jesus is king. The second gift, frankincense, was an important ingredient of the incense used in the temple and was symbolic of the prayers the people and priests gave to God. So, just as gold is associated with kings, incense is associated with God. And this second gift was the recognition that the child is divine. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Incarnate deity. He was also human, and therefore subject to death if he so willed. The third gift suggests that. Myrrh, it was used in burials and was an important commodity in ancient commerce. John recorded that when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried Jesus and when they did, they used a hundred pounds of myrrh and spices. These were not random gifts. They were very expensive gifts, gifts that indicated something important about the child they honored. They signified his royalty his deity, and his humanity, and in his humanity that he would die. That, in fact, is what he came to do. To lay down his life and save his people from their sins. The book of Matthew begins with that statement. Later in chapter 20, Jesus said that very thing. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the meaning of Christmas. These gifts all pointed to that. 
We can't say that the Magi understood all of that theology, but they certainly knew a lot. Their actions demonstrated that. They were Gentiles, but they left home to worship the king of the Jews. They went to great expense to travel a great and dangerous distance from uh, far away Persia, across the deserts of Iraq and Syria, down through Lebanon and south into Galilee and then to Judea. They crossed great rivers, risked attack by bandits, traveling miles and months with only a star to follow, while the Jews living five miles away in Jerusalem didn't even take the time to investigate. One of the ironies of history and of this book is that Gentiles announced to Jews the birth of their king and Messiah, and they didn't care. They were apathetic and unbelieving. The prosperity Herod had brought to their lives brought them uh, a, a dullness of senses, spiritually dull, so much so that the word of the child's birth only troubled them. How tragic and how dangerous and how common. Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon titled, The Far Off Near, The Near Far Off. People can be so close to Christ and the truth, they can attend church and they can hear the Bible taught and the gospel given week after week and never be moved, never come, never believe. Near but far. That was Jerusalem. It's people and priests. And it can, it, it can be people anywhere. It can be people right here in this auditorium who are so comfortable in their lives and prosperity that they give very little thought to Christ the King. And yet, those who are far off, those who grew up outside the church, who rarely heard a sermon or were, were born in a land of darkness and unbelief, come eagerly. When the gospel was carried to Oceania, and the Pacific Islands, and to Polynesian lands, the people who had known only fear and fighting and disease and death that racked and ruined their, their, their society began begging the missionaries to come to them. And they did. And the lives of those people were changed for time and eternity. Far but near. People fear that if they come to Christ, they will lose what they have. And maybe so. Their lives will be changed. You, you cannot come to Christ and be what you were. You will be changed. And look at what the Magi did. Look at what they gave up. The, the time they gave up. The treasures they gave to the child. They traveled miles in order to give him their wealth. And leave it all to a child. But they lost nothing. The treasures they laid at the boy's feet were not lost. They were an eternal investment. And, and they parted with it all gladly. They would have given more. That's wisdom. That's worship. Worship is wisdom. How different from Herod. He had it all. And he held on to it all, to everything, power and wealth, life, and kept none of it. His plot to destroy Jesus was thwarted by God, and, and who warned the wise men. And then shortly after all of that, and all of the terrible things that he did, he died. He died a painful death. At that moment, everything in this world was taken from him in an instant, and he entered forever into the terror of eternal night. That's what Christ came to save us from. He died 
so that we might live. He suffered the punishment of hell so that we would not. He did that for all who believe in Him. Salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. John Bunyan gave us a picture of that, of Christian with a heavy burden of sin on his back at the very beginning of Pilgrim's Progress. And there's an evangelist early in the book directing him to a small gate where there was a cross. And there he would lose that heavy burden of sin and guilt. Now imagine for a moment a different scene. You're familiar with that scene. But imagine not a man with sin on his back and shoulders, but a man carrying a sack of treasures to the cross. An evangelist there who asks, what's in the bag? And the man answers, treasures and gifts. He asks, well, why? To buy my forgiveness. Well, let me see, evangelist says. The man pulls out nuggets of gold labeled charity. I give a lot to the poor, he said. Evangelist said, that's nice, but that won't buy anything here. The man frowns and then pulls out silver bricks labeled faithfulness. I keep my wedding vows. That's good, but that won't pay for anything here. He pulls out others, diamonds and and rubies and emeralds labeled honesty and hard work and patriotism and on and on. Impressive, evangelist said, but they have no value here. What else do you have? And the man looks at him disappointedly and says, nothing, just this empty sack. Good, evangelist said, the Lord accepts that. Now look to the cross and be saved. That's the gospel. Salvation is free. It is the free gift of God, the greatest gift that anyone could give that has ever been given. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That's the good news. And that's the message of Christmas. Well, I'm going to close now in a word of prayer. And afterward, after the prayer, we will sing our, our next hymn. Hymn number 41 in the Songs of Praise book. And then from that hymn, we will go directly into our observance of the Lord's Supper. So let me pray. Father, we thank You for this time together, and we thank You for this glorious message of the Savior and the salvation that He came into this world not to be served, but to serve the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to serve sinners, to serve and give His life a ransom for many. Thank You for Him. Thank You for the greatest gift ever given. Bless this day for us and tomorrow especially. And now, Father, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.